You've heard of brain plasticity. This is the incredible ability of the brain to adapt to its environment, resulting in new and strengthened neural pathways. Far less talked about is muscle plasticity. This is surprising, given that muscle plasticity is probably the biggest factor contributing to your physique and athletic performance. Muscle plasticity is defined as the ability of a given muscle to alter its structural and functional properties in accordance with the environmental conditions imposed on it. In short, a more plastic muscle is more prone to hypertrophy and other structural changes. It is simply more responsive to training. This is the difference between hard gainers and the genetically fortunate. Muscle plasticity is also responsible for differences in muscle fibre type. Some people have a tendency towards slower, endurance type, type 1 muscle fibres. Others have a higher ratio of type 2, fast twitch muscle fibre. But that fibre can also be changed. So put it this way, you might be an endurance type, but if you have higher muscle plasticity, you could more successfully make the transition to a power type. In my book, Functional Training and Beyond, I describe plasticity as a super trait. That's because it's a trait that can amplify every other trait. Muscle plasticity is genetically determined to an extent, but there are definite ways to beat the odds. I recently had my DNA analysed by Self Decode, and I learned that I had a desirable SNP for ACTN3, a gene that encodes actinin alpha 3 and is related to fast twitch muscle fibre, as well as recovery and training adaptation. You can find all the studies supporting this stuff in the full article over at the website. This gene is disproportionately represented in athletes, and I can attest that I do respond very rapidly to training. I'd wager the same is probably true for many of the fitness influencers showing up on your Instagram feed. Those with the opposite XX genotype, however, may fare better in endurance type activities. Though I do also have a tendency towards tendon injuries, so there's that. Self-knowledge, though, allows for smart, personalised training and a tailored approach to diet and supplementation. It is a new frontier for coaches and self-optimization. For example, it may be possible to combat the effects of deficient or average actinin alpha-3 production via carotenoid-rich foods, such as piqui oil. If you're interested in finding out more about your own genetic profile and how it may impact your athleticism, personality and cognitive performance, not to mention allergies, hair loss, susceptibility to illness and more, then you can follow the link in the description below. I actually get a bit of a commission if you use that link, so you'd also be supporting the channel in a big way. If you've ever used Ancestry or another service that uses your DNA, you can just download the file to get immediate results. I'll also include a link to my own reports for cognitive and athletic performance. Check them out if you're at all interested. It's a cool service that I'm definitely going to be discussing more on the site in future, but that said there are others like it if you want to shop around. And whether or not you won the genetic lottery or choose to peek inside that black box, there are many other ways to enhance general muscle plasticity that should work for everyone. Here are some of the most interesting and practical. One study suggests that overtraining, at least in rats, will reduce the production of anabolic muscle transcription factors, such as myogen and MYOD, and thus reduce muscle growth. Taking a break from training is the best way to get these back, so that the muscles will become more plastic again. This may be why I've personally found such success when taking week-long breaks from training every one or two months. It feels counterintuitive, but it's actually highly effective at giving you that bounce-back response. Working on cardio could also offer significant benefits here. Once again, running regularly works wonders no matter your goals. While it's a little removed from human gym goers, one encouraging study showed that aerobic exercise could increase muscle plasticity in mice recovering from spinal cord injuries. My question is how they got the mice with the spine injuries to come forwards for the study. Did they stick up little post-it notes at a rat hospital? Oh. This was due to an increased vascularization. More blood flow allows the muscles to respond more effectively to training. Presumably then, we might also expect to see training that focuses on capillarization, such as bodybuilding style pump training, to effectively increase plasticity. This is speculation, but it does gel with what I've experienced myself and it makes logical sense. This is why the super functional program begins with a pump program that revolves around high repetitions of isolation movements and the one routine that involves high reps of calisthenics. We might similarly expect to see blood flow restriction training aid with this, as this protocol also increases capillary to muscle ratio. Another key differentiator that determines plasticity is the baseline satellite cell count of an individual. Subjects with more satellite cells experienced greater myonuclear addition and far greater muscle growth. 
Some interesting things you can do to increase this effect include supplementing with creatine and increasing testosterone. You can also benefit from longer training sessions, and it seems that training for increased capillarization also enhances muscle satellite cell proliferation. Plasticity is also responsible for recovery to a large extent. Injury occurs when the environment changes faster than the organism can adapt. So if you can adapt faster, you can prevent injury and train harder. Training is biphasic. Although you do the work in the gym, it is during rest and sleep that your muscles grow thicker and you reinforce those neural pathways. Improving recovery is largely a matter of improving your ability to rest and eating right. Getting lots of deep sleep makes a huge difference, as does avoiding stress outside the gym. Eat ample protein, nutrients and calories. Hydration is also extremely important, while light exercise such as walking can be an effective way to improve delivery of blood and nutrients to recovering muscles. Raising testosterone and other anabolic hormones through diet, exercise and sunlight exposure can once again also have a big impact on recovery. What's also more important though, is to improve cardiovascular fitness. This will again aid with the delivery of nutrients to the muscles. Meditation is also hugely beneficial, as it helps to combat stress, which prevents us from entering the most anabolic states. Certain forms of meditation can even be used to make up for lost sleep to a certain extent. Again, there are plenty of hacks and novel strategies out there that claim to enhance recovery. Proceed with caution. One, weirdly, is hydrogen water. Topical and oral administration of hydrogen-rich water appears to enhance soft tissue recovery following injury. One review of the literature stated that, in a first trial, a combination of oral and topical H2 resulted in a faster return to normal joint flexibility in 36 young men who had suffered sports-related soft tissue injuries, when administered for 14 days as complementary treatment to a traditional medical protocol for soft tissue injuries. However, it also recommended taking the findings with a grain of salt as they remain very limited in scope at this stage. Similarly, there is a surprisingly high amount of positive evidence for the effectiveness of photobiomodulation, PBM, or light therapy, as a means to both prevent muscle injury and enhance recovery. In fact, the results are so good that there is some discussion around whether athletes should be allowed to use the method when competing. This method stimulates mitochondrial production and encourages more blood flow and collagen production. Heck, there's even a fair bit of evidence for whole body cryostimulation for enhanced recovery, though I don't believe that that falls into the category of practical. Expect more in-depth explorations of these topics for future posts. To be clear though, I'm not recommending you go out and buy an expensive red light panel or start sitting in your freezer. There is not yet enough evidence for these methods, and hacking is never as effective as smart and consistent training. The point is though that being a hard gainer is not necessarily something that you're stuck with. There might be ways that you can beat the system. So I hope you found this video useful and interesting guys. If you did, please consider leaving a like and sharing it around. That helps me out immensely. Subscribe if you want to see more content like this and hit the bell button to be notified of new posts. Are you a hard gainer? And how have you overcome that challenge? Let me know in the comments. If you'd like to learn more about functional training, then check out my book, Functional Training and Beyond, available on Amazon and at all good bookstores. Sorry for the short supply before for those in Europe. It turns out that the issues were a Brexit thing, but it's all sorted now, I believe. It's also available on Audible now for those that prefer to listen. Read by me, no less. Alternatively, if you'd like a full training program that incorporates concepts like pump training and high rep calisthenics, alongside mobility, strength training, endurance, and even cognitive performance, be sure to check out my ebook and training routine, Super Functional Training. There's a link in the description and it's on discount while we're dealing with the pandemic. Remember, you can also check out Self Decode and my own reports in the description. Either way, thank you so much for watching this one, guys, and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.